Decathlon. Uh, basically, this is, um, I've been to all 10 Ruby comps, and that's not such a huge achievement. Uh, five other people, or four other people have as well. But I've also spoken at every single Ruby comp, and I say this not to brag, but rather to warn you. I am odd, somewhat of a fanboy, and very, very sad. Um, but in getting the opportunity to get up in front of the crowd at every single Ruby comp so far, I've had um, sort of this unique perspective. And the one thing that I'll caveat everything that I say from here out is that with any kind of sort of historical record, this is my perspective on history. You may get different perspectives if you go up and talk to um, different folks who have been in a bunch of different Ruby comps. But this is my take on it. But as I got ready to put together this talk, there was a problem, right? And it was the problem that, it was basically the home video problem, right? So 60 seconds of my very cute kid is very cute. He is very cute. This is my one-year-old Eaton, trying out an ice cream cone for the first time. And so home videos are great and all, but if I made you sit through 45 minutes of me reminiscing with sort of no point, you would want to off yourself at the end because my memories are all very meaningful to me, but you probably need something a little bit more to sustain you through the talk. And so I had to come up with something a little catchier, something a little more interesting, and I think, I hope, that I've, that I've come up with that. He's really cute though, isn't he? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think he's definitely gonna be hooked on fine sugar for the rest of his life, like the rest of us. Um, so, be, to, to do that, I, I basically switched this talk from um, sort of, I was going to do lightning talks of all my talks prior, which you probably don't care about, but this is going to be Secrets of RubyConf. Basically, throughout the history of being, coming to RubyConf and being involved with them, I've learned some really interesting insider tips, some things that you would only learn um, some of them you might already know, but some of them you would only learn if, if you'd spoken at a bunch of these conferences or you'd been at a bunch of them. And I want to share those with you. Um, I want them to be wider dispersed. I hope that because of them, you're able to get more out of this conference, more out of your involvement with the Ruby community in general, and in particular, if you ever decide to create your own community, whether it be around a programming language or more likely a library, uh, even a business, etc., that you can take some of these ideas, these secrets, and apply them. Now, all my talks um, always have uh, this idea of being open. Um, I want you to tweet about the talk. In particular, again, I'm up against Jim Wyrick. Even if he gets most of the people, I want to get most of the tweets. So please, um, tweet, uh, RubyConf and Secrets are the hashtags so that I can find them afterwards. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing what y'all will say. The one other thing that I'll tell you up front is that I have exactly 44 slides and they all advance after 60 seconds. So this is a little different in that uh, I'm definitely not gonna run over. Um, might have time for a question or two at the end, but uh, this is uh, sort of uh, long format, uh, pick a, uh, how do you say that? Pink uh, Kucha um, type talk. So to begin with, we go um, back to 2001, very first RubyConf. Um, as Dave talked about this morning, the Pickaxe book had come out mere months beforehand. Um, I actually got involved in Ruby first when the Pickaxe book came out. It was at uh, Uppsala 2001, no, Uppsala 2000, I believe, that it originally came out. I got the pickaxe, got really uh, interested in Ruby. I was working with um, a small talker at the time, and the interesting thing about the genesis of RubyConf is it started off where it, it sort of tagged along with Uppsala. It would be the two days before Uppsala and then Uppsala. And I think this worked out really well because what you found out is that a lot of the people who attended uh, RubyConf were basically, uh, and interested in Ruby, were disenfranchised small talkers, and that was also the audience for Uppsala. So um, basically, you have all these um, object people getting interested in Ruby, and I say all of these, right? The first Ruby comp was 30 people, um, approximately. And so we all gathered there in Tampa, Florida, um, 
in this hotel, and as I was looking up pictures of the different venues, it was a Holiday Inn when we first were in it. I think early on in RubyConf's history, um, there was some kind of close correlation between us being at a hotel and it later like going out of business and getting bought by another chain. So <laughs> take that for what you will. But um, RubyConf 2001, the amazing thing to me about it was that it was, there was no corporate entity behind Ruby that was pushing RubyConf forward. There was no, no uh, uh, sort of organization that was saying, you know, we're going to make sure that Ruby gets big in the US. Um, rather, RubyConf happened because uh, a bunch of people on the mailing list, which wasn't the English language mailing list, wasn't even that old itself at the time, said, we'd really like to meet this guy, Max, because he posts on the English language mailing list in riddles, these short, pithy sayings, and, we, and he's like this mysterious Japanese figure who created this language that we love. We'd really like to meet him. So let's put together a conference that basically has, just has enough money to um, bring Max over and pay for the venue. And that's what happened. But my, sort of my inspiration for this secret of RubyConf is Guy Hurst, because Dave mentioned in the talk, um, even though at the last minute some other folks had to step in and make sure that RubyConf happened, it was Guy Hurst who was the genesis for RubyConf. Without him, it would not have happened that first year. And the really amazing thing is that Guy Hurst, as far as I know, isn't involved with Ruby at all now. But yet, at that point in time, he was the right person in the right place, and he took initiative to make something happen. And that was awesome, because it changed people's lives. RubyConf 2001 changed the trajectory of my professional life. Period. Flat out. And here's one guy who, because he got involved, made that happen. And not just for me, but for a lot of other people. I dare say that the majority of the people in this room would not be here if not for Guy Hurst starting the ball rolling on RubyConf 2001. And the secret here is that leading is being followed. Right? You just start walking in a direction and you start setting the tone for something you're passionate about and you gather people behind you in your wake and something happens. And it's something that anybody can do. Um, there's no need to be a famous person. There's no need to um, already have some level of notoriety. Um, a lot of times there's no need even to be involved long term. You just get something going and then it becomes self-sustaining. And that was the secret that I learned from Guy Hirsch that very first year at RubyConf. And it's something that I've seen throughout, woven throughout um, the Ruby community ever since, where regular people get involved and make stuff happen. So 2002, RubyConf moves on to, um, to Seattle, Washington, home of the Space Needle, that odd piece of architecture that I don't even know what it's there for. Um, it was originally for the World Trade, World's Trade Fair, but it's still there. And in 2002, for me, was a particularly memorable RubyConf. And it had nothing to do with Ruby. It had to do with the fact that I'd just gotten married about two weeks earlier, and came to RubyConf almost immediately after the honeymoon, and brought my new bride with me. So I was having as good a time at the conference as I was at the hotel as I was at the conference. Um, but so we all gathered together there in RubyConf, and um, it was, there were a lot of things that, that were interesting about that year. One was the initial sort of rise of the Seattle Ruby Brigade. Um, the very first .rb group, um, they, came, they coined the .rb um, uh, sort of post fix for local Ruby meetups. And so a lot of those folks showed up at RubyConf for the first time that year. I also found it interesting when I went and pulled this off of archive, it still says rubyconf.new2001, but then it has the right schedule. So I don't know if that's a fact of archiving or what, but um, it was still a very community-driven conference. Um, but the really interesting thing about RubyConf 2002 was that this guy showed up and talked about YAML. And YAML was very new at that point in time, right? Um, it had just come out. And this guy who called himself Why the Lucky Stiff came and, and talked about YAML. And the weird thing is that, looking back, 
why did he was not an alt rocker absurdist personality at that point in time. He was maybe headed in that direction, but I remember why as being preppy surfer dude. Okay, I couldn't find a picture of him then, but he came across as as very different than what his persona ended up being. But the great thing about why was that he he sort of dug into Ruby early on, and he introduces all the YAML, which had, is pervasive throughout the Ruby community now, and something we're all familiar with. But he um, worked on all these different projects and constantly in, invited contributions, and people. he wanted people to make things with the things that he was making. He didn't want them to simply use them, but he wanted people to make things. And the secret that I learned from why was that famous people are people too. So youth it's really easy to see that person up on stage. Now, Dave Thomas told us that this morning that if you go up and try to talk to him in a crowd, he'll probably just nod his head at you. But it has nothing to do with him being famous. It just has to do with the fact he can't hear you. Um, and, but in general, anyone who you think of in the Ruby community as being a famous person, they love to talk about the things that they're passionate about. They would love it if you said, oh, I'm really interested in uh, this particular topic. Let's talk about it. And so don't ever hesitate to go up and talk to um, the famous people in any given community because they're just people like you are, just like Y was. Now, nobody's a person like Y was. And it's really, he, he, anyhow, he made it really hard to say sentences about him. Um, but at the same time, I think that this is yet another lesson that we can learn from Y the Lucky Step. So it's 2003, and RubyConf moves on to Austin, Texas. Now, you may be starting to notice a pattern here. Um, RubyConf, all except for one year, has always gone East Coast, West Coast, Central. East Coast, West Coast, Central. So this is the first Central Conference in Austin, Texas. Memorable for me because I got the opportunity to stay with Hal Fulton. Um, he lives in Austin, Texas, and I stayed with him at the, the conference. Now, I say this, and this is just kind of, the, this is a... This is a secret that, that isn't even on the slide deck, so only you, you get it and anybody watching the video. And that is that um, always stay at the conference hotel. Hal was awesome. I enjoyed spending time with him. But you miss out on stuff if you're not right there where the action is happening. And, and in particular, in 2003, that action all centered around the project that Eric just talked about, which is Ruby Gems. Now in 2001, at the very first RubyConf, there was a talk by a guy named Brian Levengood on this project called RubyGems. And it was this cool package management thing that he was working on, and then it just kind of fizzled and died on the vine. But then, as time went on, right, we're, we're two years later now, and everybody's going, we need a package management solution for Ruby. Um, and so, a bunch of folks got together at RubyConf 2003, and I remember coming to the hotel and going into the bar, and there is just this hive of activity. I mean, literally, just like people moving all over the place through these round tables like this, um, like this high, and the super high chairs that go with them. And there's like two or three laptops crammed on each one of these little tiny tables. And people are like crowded around them, hacking away. And what had happened was, um, Rich Kilmer, in particular, I remember sort of saying, and I think Chad may, uh, there were a bunch of people involved in this, but I think of Rich because he's kind of my quintessential, he can hack more code with his pinky than I could do if I could use my toes as well as my fingers. Um, and he basically said, look, everybody's complaining about this, but we should actually do something about it. Let's go and, and steal the name and any concepts we can from the old Ruby Gems, and let's actually code this up. Let's make something happen. And it did. And now, you could say something about the code quality. Um, typically, a project that starts at a bar is not going to be the best ever in terms of you know, uh, test coverage and, and uh, clean code and architecture. But it was a start. And it was enough, and it got people excited enough that they went back and they continued to refine it and develop it and do more with it. And Ruby Gems has influenced not just the Ruby community, but it's also influenced a bunch of other programming languages who look at Ruby Gems and go, wow, we wish we had a package management system like that. And then they build it. Um, and so I am really, really 
um, happy to have found that Hackfest going on in the bar in 2003. And the secret is that conferences are for Hackfests and for other such interactive things that you can do only at a conference. It's really easy to come to a conference and basically pick up a bunch of information that you could have just as easily read on the web next week when it got published. Instead, I'd encourage you to come to a conference and look for those sessions, look for those talks, look for, in particular, those opportunities to interact with other people in ways that you could not otherwise. So, and, and the other really interesting thing to me about the, the RubyConf 2003 Hackfest is that it was so all-inclusive of the conference. I think almost everyone who was at the conference that year touched the RubyGem source code in some way. I remember standing at a table with David Allen Black looking at the version comparison code and doing something with it. And I think that was a common experience for almost everyone that was at the conference that year. And so look for how you can build Hackfests, et cetera, that aren't just the normal characters, but how can you draw in other people, get them excited about what you're doing, and hack together with them. So 2004, RubyConf goes to Chantilly, Virginia, um, uh, otherwise known as pretty much a suburb of DC. And um, this is the year that everything changed but we didn't know it yet. This was the last year where RubyConf did not, as far as I know, sell out its seats. I don't think there were any other years uh, after this that where RubyConf didn't sell out. Um, but we had no clue, right? We just all went to another RubyConf. It was about 60 people, right? So over about f over three years at this point, it had pretty much doubled in size, um, which isn't really a very great growth rate. It, you're wondering. It, but it was a lot of fun. It was usually the same crowd. But this guy with this really hard to understand, uh, a pronounced name, and even harder to spell, um, he was talking on the mailing list. He kind of popped up all of a sudden. And he's like, I'm working on this and sticky thing. And I have this framework. And you should check it out. And it was exciting. And he made this blog post in, in, or blog engine in 10 minutes video. And we're like, OK, this is kind of interesting. So he comes out to RubyConf 2004 and presents on Rails. And it was, it was a good um, presentation. The main thing I took away with it was he was using TextMate. And I was like, I want to get me some of that. And so he, um, he basically uh, gave pre -release, a pre-release version to um, most of the people that were there. It was also the beginning of the Mac ascendancy. I actually think Apple should have sponsored that year um, because it was from sort of that point in time that I, I remember it, it became like the only thing. Like right now, let's see, I see one, one non-Mac computer at the moment in the audience. Um, but David came out and he talked about, like I said, the, the presentation was good, it was solid. It wasn't like, wow, this is the most amazing thing ever. Um, but the interesting thing was he didn't stop there. So many times what happens is you create this cool library, you go out to a conference one time, you talk about it, and you hope that people will pick it up. But David morphed himself from the geek into the amazing marketer and took Rails to a point where it was sustainable and he was able to um, work on his passion all the time and have so many other people contributing to um, this uh, project. And of course, it greatly affected the Ruby community as a whole. So, what I learned, the secret that I learned from David is that your passion is worth marketing. And this is something that we geeks fail at so utterly, so often. We look at marketing as being a bad word. You know, I don't want to be one of those hype guys with everybody drinking the Kool-Aid. But the truth is, if you want to be able to work on your passion long term, if you want a lot of other people using it, you've got to be bold enough to go out there and say, this is awesome. I think this is awesome. I think that you'll find it to be awesome too. And I, I really think you should get involved. And look at how it's changed this community. It hasn't just improved Ruby around Rails. It has improved Ruby in general. The Rubinius project, as it exists today, would not have happened if not for Rails. Um, you can point at project out. Rack would not be here if not for Rails. 
project after project after project after cool thing after cool thing after cool thing, all because one guy, one geek, decided to actually get serious about marketing what he was passionate about. And you can do that too. So 2005, Ruby Conf goes to San Diego to a sold out crowd of, um, it, the, it, the expectation wasn't that it would sell out, so it wasn't actually that big of a crowd. It was like 150, um, 170 people. Um, really interesting venue. It's like uh, it, there were like the Bob Hope Room and the Lucille Ball Room, etc., and um, is basically like this hotel that, in its glory days, hosted all these stars. Um, little did they know that we were coming. Um, and down in the basement there was the meeting room and it was like if you've ever if you ever saw the Rocketeers sort of that 50s style lounge singer shell in the back kind of a thing um, and so we're there in 2005 and it's very obvious that things are changing and they're changing very very rapidly um, and a lot of that was around rails every single break um, the rails guys and there was now the Rails guys. The Rails guys were in this clump in the um, uh, lobby working on the next release of Rails. There's so many more people. Um, there's a ton of excitement around the whole conference. And uh, I had the opportunity to give what I think was my best talk ever. So if I was going to personally get, uh, rank all my talks, 2003 in Austin would have been the worst. Um, ever, and 2005 would be the best ever. So um, it was on the long tail of software. You can still find an essay form out on the web. But the thing that I learned from that was that, um, well, let me tell you first about um, the person that I met through that. So he's sitting here in the audience. Um, John Carlin came up to me after my talk, uh, as well as a bunch of other people. He's like, hey man, I'm working on some cool stuff, here's my car. And he just like, and I don't remember if he contacted me first or I contacted him first, but we started talking. And because of that initial conversation, we looked at one business idea, he introduced me to his designer friend, and then uh, three years ago, I said, I, I came up with a business idea and I was looking for people to partner up with. John was one of them. Um, Alex Kohlhofer, the designer he'd introduced me to was another, um, Duff Amelia, was the fourth one of us, and we basically formed Spreedly at that point in time. Spreedly would not have the founders that it has today, and probably wouldn't even exist today if I had not given that talk. And so the, the thing that John taught me that day, the secret, was that um, speakers have the best conversations. They basically get to um, to have a whole set of conversations. Here's, here's why this is, right? So it's this basic human hack. I was just reading about speaking. The thing is, when I'm up here, I'm like kind of terrified by the fact that I'm facing off against all of you. Um, the, the book I was reading said uh, that basically there's nothing scarier to, the, to our um, sort of more uh, basic brain than being up in front of a group of other individuals all alone um, in a situation where we pretty much can't run away. Um, but you're all sitting out there in the audience, and as far as you're concerned, I'm just having a conversation with you. What that means is that after this talk is done, all of you will feel like you've already had this conversation with me and will feel comfortable, especially being the geeks that you are and not especially gregarious to talk, talk to people you don't know. You now feel like you know me, and so you'll come up and talk to me. Um, in a way that you wouldn't have otherwise. And this is why speakers get to have the best conversations, especially, especially technical, conversa uh, technical conferences, is because now we have established rapport and I get to have interesting conversations with all of you. Um, that and if I was a non-speaker in my normal sort of uh, uh, fearful of public or personal, interpersonal interaction with strangers, I wouldn't normally have. So I highly, highly recommend that if you have the opportunity to speak at a conference, take it. Take the opportunity to get up in front of other people, 
um, to be extremely nervous, because I always am. Everybody who does any amount of public speaking has those nervous uh, moments. The difference is that my butterfly is now flying formation. Um, I stole that from somebody else. Um, but, uh, so anyhow, take the opportunity to speak, because you will have better conversations because of it. So 2006, RubyConf heads to um, Denver, Colorado, which, if 2005 was the best talk I ever gave, 2006 was bar none the best RubyConf ever. And it was just a combination of factors. Everything was firing, um, and every, all the knobs were turned up to 10. The content was amazing. The venue was great. It was our first time ever at an embassy suite with the, the whole atrium in the middle, and people just congregated there and hacked and played Nintendo DS and um, talked. And, and there was just this whole, I played my first ever game of Catan, right? So it was just an amazing year for RubyConf. And um, it was also the very last year that RubyConf was single track. And there's something different about a single track conference. There's something, uh, there's a shared experience that happens at a single track conference that you just, uh, as wonderful as larger conferences are, and the, the, the things that you can do with them that you can't do at a smaller conference, there's something really cool about a single track conference. And, and RubyConf 2006 was that conference. But there was this one guy who came to RubyConf 2006, and he gave this really funny talk where he was talking about fed, fuzzing web interfaces. And uh, he started off by saying, I'm going to do a bunch of math in this talk, and I have this, the math to back it up, but don't be that guy and be constantly calling me out on my math. And so throughout the whole talk, he's like, don't be that guy. So the rest of the conference, everybody's like, don't be that guy. Um, and, and so it was really funny. Uh, this, of course, was Zed Shaw. And Zed Shaw um, is a character, as Dave alluded to in his talk. Um, he's never decided to call me out publicly, probably just because I don't rank. Um, but, um, <laughs> um, but um, Zed did teach me something really interesting, and it kind of goes back to a, a, an underlying principle in the Ruby community, and that is Miniswan. Max is nice, so we are nice. Um, and, and really, the, the thing that I've always appreciated about the Ruby community is that there is no problem with having lots of heated dis discussion and debate about concepts. But when it descends to the level of personal attack, um, you stop talking about concepts and you start dealing with all kinds of personal stuff that doesn't really help. And Zed kind of taught me that. But the real secret is that controversy is the best and the worst recruiter for a community. It's the best because there is no better way to attract a whole bunch of attention to your community than have something blow up really big. And there's nothing that blows up bigger than, uh, than a flame war. But it's also the worst in that it's not, those aren't always the folks that you want to necessarily attract to your community. And also, a lot of the people that come in and see that kind of conflict are going to go, I'm not really interested in this, and keep moving. I still like to read Zed, um, but if I had to be completely honest, I'm glad he hates the Ruby community. Um, so in 2007, RubyConf moves on to Charlotte, North Carolina, three hours from my hometown of Raleigh. Um, and uh, it's nice when it's on the East Coast, I, I can always try it. Um, and so it met in downtown Charlotte, even though Charlotte's only three hours away from Raleigh, is the most time I've ever spent in Charlotte before. You know how that goes when you live close to a place you actually don't spend very much time. Um, happened in the very impressively shaped Omni Hotel. And the thing that I think everyone who is at RubyConf 2007 remembers about that RubyConf is werewolf. It was werewolf this, and werewolf that, and werewolf the other. And here's the truth, it was a blast. It was so much fun. Um, I, I remember sitting around and, and got to know some people at a level that I, I sort of didn't before. Now I got to know sort of their dark side, their I can tell really good lies side, but still, I got to know them at a, at a level that, that I 
had it previously. The other really good thing about 2007 being about werewolves so much is that I think we burned it completely out of our system. As far as I can tell, there's never been a Ruby conference since that was dominated um, by werewolf to that level. It was like, okay, we're done now. That was fun. Um, and we've moved on, hopefully, to, to uh, hacking pursuits, etc. But at RubyCon 2007, um, I gave a talk entitled, uh, Why Camping Matters. Um, and I related uh, the importance of hacking to the concept of a bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit. That was highly entertaining, if I do say so myself. Um, but the, uh, the interesting thing was, I had somebody come up to me afterwards and say, when you talk at uh, the same conference this many times, you start to get a few groupies, um, but uh, it, it's okay. And uh, so one of them came up to me, very positive guy in general, um, and, and said, I love the fact that you always have like this theme, and there's always like something different and entertaining and interesting about your talks. And uh, I, I kind of thought, wow, I'm glad you weren't here in 2003. But, um, so Joe O'Brien basically sort of said this, and then Joe has gone on to be extremely entertaining himself, um, has really developed his speaking skills, and, uh, and teaches in a way that I think people really get, because it's interactive and interesting and entertaining. He spends a lot of time with Jim Weirich, who does the same thing. Um, and so the thing that I really learned from that experience, the secret is that conferences are entertainment. You thought you came here to learn something, but I say that you came here to be entertained and happen to learn something as a side effect. The fun things about conferences are the, the laughs, the uh, interesting things that you never would have learned unless you'd been sitting across the table from that person, um, the, the, the uh, more intense social interactions, the opportunity to just interact on a level and, and have fun at a level that you can't have online. And so I would encourage you as you approach your conference attendance, um, as you're here at RubyConf, as you go to conferences in the future, if you ever organize a conference, as you present at conferences, to keep this in mind, that you should think as much about entertaining the audience as about, um, uh, and, and also seek out those opportunities to be entertained because those are the, the, the places where you're going to learn something because it's going to stick in your mind. I most remember some of the most entertaining talks throughout all of the Ruby conferences. And so definitely keep that in mind as you attend and as you present. So 2008, RubyConf goes to Orlando, Florida, the first time that it did not cycle. It stuck on the East Coast. Yes, my coast. Um, and. Uh, stayed there in Orlando and moved to Orlando, Florida, and sort of, it, it was cool in one way and not so cool in another, but the centerpiece of RubyConf 2008 was the location, because this is definitely the only RubyConf where there was a lazy river behind a hotel, okay? And they had these awesome suites that my whole family like stayed in, like a four bedroom suite and like the whole family was there, it was a fantastic time. There were good restaurants in the hotel, which was good because it was completely isolated from anything else. Um, and so there were, there were pluses and minuses there. 2008 was a lot of fun, but the thing that I really noticed in 2008 was some other folks came um, that I knew, um, like from the Raleigh area, et cetera, and while they enjoyed it, it seemed like I was getting so much more out of the conference. It just seemed like, um, you know, I was, you know, was I just having these much more interesting conversations? Was it there was some kind of in crowd, some kind of click going on? I wasn't sure, like, what exactly was was causing this. And um, so, as I as the week went by, um, and as we sort of kept going through. Um, I started to, I got inspired by a presentation that the Seattle Ruby Brigade did. Um, basically, a bunch of them got up and talked about a whole bunch of different projects that they had going on. And in thinking about that, the sort of the conclusion that I came to was that, you know, they just had, uh, 
Seattle RB, to back up a little bit, has just always inspired me with their sense of community. The fact that they are just always hacking on something really hardcore, and they get so many different people involved in it. And this guy has this project, but this other guy works with them on it, and I think they have like weekly hack nights, which is really cool. Um, we manage monthly in Raleigh. Um, and so the, the inspiration for me, sort of the, the realization that I started coming to, came from this guy, Ryan Davis, um, and what he inspired at Seattle RB. Now, this picture was challenging to find. Finding a picture of Ryan that's smiling at the camera, and, and he isn't at simultaneously flipping the cameraman off, is very challenging. Is that why you cropped it so close? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, he is, he's a character. If he finds out that I put him in my presentation, a picture of him in my presentation, he might stab me afterwards. Um, <laughs> and he could definitely take me in a fight. So, um, but Ryan and the Seattle RB, I just remember at multiple Ruby comps coming along and like sitting down to Ryan, talking some, we kind of knew each other from back in 2002, and he'd always be hacking on something. And man, if you're ready to, he'll just like grab you and be like, I'm working on this, and I'm trying to figure this out. He's more than ready to include you at any point in time. And what I came to realize is that within any community, you get cliques that form. They're basically just groupings of people with common interests. And the best cliques are meritocracies. The kinds of, the kinds of groupings that you should seek to form are meritocratous, if that's a word, in, in that you want to invite anyone in that's ready to contribute. If you're ready to dig in, then come on and join us. And the, the thing that I saw there in 2008 was that um, Yes, there were some people who weren't as um, uh, engaged in the conference, but I found that that was mostly because they weren't as involved in the conference. They were working on this thing over here, or they were out over here, as opposed to really engaging with the conference as a whole. So seek to make and seek to join cliques that are meritocracies. Now, in 2009, RubyConf um, moves on to San Francisco, California. And uh, the uh, 2009 was the year that I learned that 5K wasn't simply a measurement of distance. It was actually a, a, a you know a race and uh, a run that you could do. Now I did not run that year, but I am going to run tomorrow morning, as I hope some of you are. Um, John talked me into it. See, there there are other things that can happen when you meet people because you give conference talks. Um, and so the really interesting thing to me about 2009 was the contrast with 2001. In 2001, there's 30 people. When asked, when the room was asked, that's less, you realize that that is significantly less than the number of people in this room, as sparsely populated as it is. It's really, it's probably about as many people as there are on this side of the room. Um, and when asked how many of them were getting paid to do Ruby, one of them raised their hand. And yet, Last year, in San Francisco, we pack out the embassy suites there. And not only that, but the startups in San Francisco set up a bus tour specifically to like bus the Ruby people around because they're all using Rails and they can't find developers. Like This is the contracts, the, the change that's happened over nine years. And it's absolutely phenomenal, the growth that we've seen. But the, the, the downside is that these conferences keep growing bigger and bigger. Um, and it gets harder and harder for me to meet more of you people out there. So please come up and let's talk about stuff. But seriously, how do you, how do you deal with this growth? Well, um, in 2006, the first Ruby hoedown happened, and this was memorable to me, not because it was the first regional conference, etc. It was just the first conference I ever co-organized, and the last one to date as well. Um, and because of, and, but the fascinating thing to me about the Ruby community is I've never seen a programming community that has been so um, focused on spreading out to a bunch of different conferences. Um, Ruby Central sponsors them. Jeremy McAnally is my, my hero because he co-organized the first hoedown. And when I said, when the second one came up, I said, man, I am too busy. I cannot do this. He just went and did the whole thing himself from then on out. Um, so he's like really my hero. Um, and so Jeremy um, put these 
put the hoedown together. But the first regional Ruby conference, I believe, was Yuruko in 2003 in Europe. Some local Rubyists in Europe said, we want to have our conference too. And they got together. I think there were probably less of them than there were at the first Ruby conference in 2001. But they had a blast. They continued to do it. Um, and that has been a constant pattern. And the secret is, and this is really important, if you're going to build a community and you market it like crazy and it grows, Recognize that conferences scale best horizontally. So look for ways that you can scale out your community, spread people out, find lots of events that people can get involved with. It's, it's one of the reasons that this conference has such great talks is because there are so many regional conferences that act as proving grounds for new speakers and give the new folks the opportunity to show their stuff and for people to get excited about it. And the thing is, when you do a regional conference, can I just say, make it a single track? Um, I've seen some folks starting up regional conferences and trying to do multi-track, but the cool part about a small regional conference is you can do one track, and it gives you shared experience across the whole group. So conferences do scale best horizontally. The big ones are fun, don't deny it, but the small ones are where I think the real learning and the real growth happen. So here we are, 2010. New Orleans, Louisiana, and um, who knows? I mean, I, I look back 10, well, nine years technically to the 2001 RubyConf, and I think, like, what does nine, 10 years from now look like? I have no earthly idea because I sure would not have predicted this in 2001. None of us would have predicted this back in 2001. Um, we never, we, all programming languages hope for the killer application. Very few of them find it. Um, and it's not something that you can sort of create out of the blue. But it's, it's really fun to be here. And my hope is that these secrets of RubyConf give you some ideas for maximizing your experience here. That um, as you go through the conference, you'll be looking for those sessions that are going to entertain you as well as inform you. Um, that in the future, as you present, that you will be looking towards how you can um, learn from the audience afterwards by having an ongoing conversation with them. But my real, the thing that I really wonder about this year is when I look back at it in 10 years, what am I going to remember? I don't know yet. We just started, right? Um, and, and some of the things that I remember um, from uh, so long ago, I didn't seem to ma matter at the time. Um, I know one thing that I will remember about this year, and that is being put up against Jim Weirich. Um, <laughs> bless his heart. Um, and so uh, my, what I'm wondering is, when I think of the people who influenced me at RubyCon 2010, who will it be? It could be one of you. Um, it probably will be one of you. And I look forward to seeing how um, I am shaped by yet another conference. And I haven't decided. Next year, do I do another talk, or do I skip a year to take the pressure off? Um, I'm not sure. Um, but I want to thank all of you for coming, for listening, um, for being involved. Um, and I want to go ahead and take time for two or three questions uh, I can answer on history. I will also mention, I have all the RubyConf t-shirts laid out over here. Feel free to uh, check them out if you're interested. So, any questions? Yes? So, um, I'm going to mark it one of my passions by asking you if you'd like to come to our little regional conference in Sweden and talk at Nordic Ruby next year. Okay. It sounds <coughs> awesome, man. Yeah, I've heard really good things about it. So I will take that as an invite and go ahead and get it on my calendar. Awesome. We'll talk more later. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Nathaniel, I just want to say this is a great topic to encourage people to get out of their shell and to speak about their passions. And I really want to just salute you. Thank you. What yep. was your 2003 talk that was so bad? <laughs> I don't remember it being bad. So it was a clueless Ruby hacker explorer security, and a speaker is always much more critical of their talks than, than anybody else. But to me, it was just kind of flat. So.
So um, you can actually find the, um, I went back and looked at the slides, and you know, there's some content there, I guess. <laughs> yeah? Uh, follow up on the Nordic Review thing. Um, we were talking last night about trying to resurrect uh, Elohan Rail, so if you want to come talk. Um, yeah. <laughs> because we might kill it. We may do Ruby Hump in Hawaii next year. Well, that would be <laughs> Wow. Is that, wow. Is that West Coast or East Coast? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Up the island, it's going to be Does a, that mean are you going to do like a Pacific <laughs> one? And if I go to Australia, I'm going to do it. That would be, no, I, Hawaii, well, the problem with Hawaii is I have to bring my whole family. Yeah. If I go to Hawaii by myself, I am in so much trouble. <laughs> the thing I was at San Diego, I had no long tail talk was awesome. Yeah, it, I, you know, I don't want to toot my own horn, but at the same time, if I look at all of my talks, some of which have been quite lame, that one was awesome. So, you should go out and read it if you haven't. It's still out there. I am sorry to say that the mailing list that was spawned from that is totally defunct. Yeah. It's not 100% spam right now. So. <laughs> I forgot there was a mailing list. <laughs> I don't know yet. I don't know. Not sure. Haven't decided on that one. Not sure what I think about Disneyland. I have a question on exactly this topic. Yes. You've encouraged people to participate deeply with the conferences that they attend, and yet, if you bring your family, isn't that somewhat of a distraction? Aren't you somewhat obligated to spend some time with them if you brought them along? How do you balance those things? Because I would like to do the same, and yet I don't see myself pulling off. Well, so Katie and I have an agreement <laughs> that when I go to conferences, I disappear. And she likes to come along just so that she gets to see me at all, as opposed to not seeing me at all. And so um, the, the kids, even though they don't, now I did see there was a kids track this year. I didn't know that that was happening, but as my kids get older, that, that could be a lot of fun to do. But at the same time, um, the kids get something out of just being here and like just coming in when I'm giving a talk and being in the back and just seeing that this is when I come to a conference is what I do. But, it's, it is challenging, um, but again, it's mostly about setting expectations. So, all right, well, thank you so much for coming. Um,